Strategies Editor, and I am live today with the wonderful psychotherapist, Malcolm Stern. Malcolm, welcome. Lovely to see you um, here today. I've just read your book. I've just um, written an article about it. I am a huge, massive fan. Slay Your Dragons with Compassion is your new book. Congratulations. Uh, oh, ta -da! oh, lovely cover. I love the guy because I read it. Beautiful yeah. colour. Yes. It's a really nice cover. Um, before we get, before we start, just tell me a little bit because the story about what inspired you to write this this book is incredibly heartbreaking. So tell us a little bit about why you wrote this. My daughter Melissa took her own life in 2014. And as it would be bound to do, it crippled me inside. And bit by bit, I found that I had resources that I had already built that had taught me how to deal with tragedy that had un unearthed itself in my life. And it wasn't until 2018 when I started a conversation with my friend Ben Crabe, who's an editor and, and, uh, and worked for a publisher, that we had the idea of putting a book together and drawing out all the things that I do. And he would help me write it, which he did. And, um, and I then realised there were probably something like 10 good practices that would help us to thrive even when life feels impossible. And I know that's been true for me. So the, the great thing about the book is it's my, I've written myself an instruction primer. It just happens that I put it out to other people as well. But I, I didn't realize that I was writing it for me. But then I realized after a while that actually these are my practices. Yeah, these are the tools. I mean, when I read the book, um, obviously as editor of Psychologies, I get a lot of books across my desk every day. Um, and I was kind of really blown away by the exercises in the book. It, it's very deep, it's very profound. Um, we've written a big piece about it, which is coming out in the December issue. Um, but what you, I think probably it's it's profound because written in your in your words, you've you've suffered the worst thing I think that any person could suffer, in my opinion, is to lose a child. Um, and you know, you're still, and within that, you in it being a self development expert and a psychotherapist, you kind of mind your wisdom to find the best way to be able to not just survive this this terrible tragedy, but also to to thrive in this this thing. And and what a, the timing of it is so perfect, isn't it? Because we're in this this lockdown where we're being completely bombarded by this this weird disease virus that we don't know how to cope with so what would be you you know so not everyone will have faced tragedy like you but many of us are facing difficulties that we've never had to deal with before yeah. so where do we start on the journey of kind of setting a new kind of a foundation for ourselves so we can keep ourselves sane and together and functioning you know functioning on some level to start with where do we start Malcolm? I think we start with community because this is not a grief memoir it, it, it is it does tell Melissa's story to a small degree and it comes in at various times but actually this is a this is a book which is about what are the practices and for me one of the most profound practices is is the using the Buddhist terminology Sangha S-A-N-G-H-A which yeah. is creating a community of like-minded others. And for me, there's something very profound about that. That's what helped me get through this. I knew I had people that I could go to who I could, it, it wasn't even about talking about Melissa, it was that I could be with them and that they would be open and able to stay in relationship with me. Because I, I remember a friend of mine whose son died and she said, um, people used to cross the road to avoid her. And yeah. we, we need people who, who dare to be with us in our places of profound tragedy or profound anger even, that we need to practice being with each other and not rejecting the difficult stuff. I think it's so true. I mean, um, I think I mentioned to you before that I lost my parents when I was a teenager. So I kind of, death came fairly early into my life. And like you, I was surrounded by young people at university and no one knew how to be with me. And it was the loneliest, loneliest place in the world. And I think, as you say, ha teaching people to be with people who are in grief is a really big thing. And it's it's something that I I am really conscious about when, when my friends have lost someone, I, I reach out 
and I sit with them and I get them to talk and not, you know, just, just to, to acknowledge it, to say, I know this hurt and I know you're heartbroken and, and just to be with that heartbreak, which is really, really hard. If you were going to give advice to people who to hold Sangha for people, again, what, how, how do we do that? Because it's, well, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. It's true. And then here again, the, pro, the practices are in the group, in, in the book. And you just led me to um, the first practice, which is bear witness. This isn't about fixing each other. That's what we tend to do. Someone will come to us with a problem. We go, oh, why don't you try this? Or my friend did that. Or I did this when this happened. Actually, if we dare to drop a bit deeper in ourselves and practice presence, which is very much Eckhart Tolle, um, his, his whole teaching is based on that practice of being in the present, of staying present. And um, if we can practice presence, then we have a great deal of possibility of the other person being able to open up because we create a safe environment by that very practice. And when, I mean, you're right, you do, what I love about the book is really practical as well. So you talk about presence, talk to me about what that actually means, what to be present and you know give our presence to someone. How do we do that? Okay, well, the very first thing is to slow down. So the first thing that I have to do if I'm looking at being present in a situation is to breathe, breathe slowly, be, to breathe consciously, to notice in my body where there is tension and to, and to drop the tension, to make eye contact with the other person so that actually you're there with them, you're connecting with them, and to soften our heart around our hearts. I think that's a very profound thing that we often guard our hearts, but actually it's the softened, vulnerable heart that is the beautiful thing to walk into. Yeah, and so imagine, you know, sitting with someone who has an open heart who's making eye contact who's listening and as you say i think maybe there's a lot of stress for people to think well i've got to make this better or make people feel good about themselves or how can i well i, I won't find the right thing to say and often it's all the focus is on yourself and i in a way the presence to me is about it's not about you it's brilliant susie yes that's exactly it there isn't the right thing to say what there is, is presence. So Stephen Levine, who, is a, who wrote a book called um, Who Dies, he wrote, wrote written quite a few books about death and dying. Um, he, he talked about people who were dying. And when they were dying, they couldn't do bullshit. So um, perhaps the cleaner would come into their war, into their, by their bed, and they'd see that the cleaner was able to be with them. And so they would have a genuine dialogue with them. And perhaps their doctor would come in brisk and sort of full of professionalism and with no room for that practice of presence. And they would just go, yeah, I'm fine today, doctor, because they'd know that he couldn't really hear them. So we know when someone is able to really be with us and listen to us. Yeah, so, and, and in terms of Sangha, I mean, just as a practice, every, you know, in our everyday life, how do we, how do you put out the call for that? How do you, in you're a psychotherapist and I know you do group therapy and that is part of your, your practice of what you do. But for everyday people living their life, how, how did they kind of say, I want to create a Sangha group or, and, and this is what it means? How, what would, how, how would you suggest that, that you set that up? What I often say to people and they say to me, well, I, you know, I, I need support. I'd say, well, who's the person in your life at the moment with whom you feel that that's possible? And perhaps you haven't had the dialogue with them where that is the case. So, for example, on every Monday morning at 8.30, I have an hour with my friend Nick. And um, we, we take a half an hour each to talk about our lives and to get reflection from the other after we've spoken. Um, that's a one-on-one -on -one Sangha that's there. Um, yeah. Then, I, you know, my groups are, you know, are places where Sangha is practiced. We become communities that can really hear each other and that dare to go to difficult places with each other. And also we practice the, what I consider the most important aspect. We practice authenticity and integrity in our communication. So I think start with, look out for what's in your area. Two is you could join a, a group. I know that people like Jack Cornfield and Tara Brack um, run groups online that are about Sangers. Um, in yeah. fact, I sent an email this morning from Tara Brack saying that there, there's a Sanger that's going to be set up. That's yeah. B-R-A-C-H. Someone, something like that. So you go, you start making a research project of, where are the places where you can really be heard? But I would start with a friend with whom you think there's the possibility of deepening the dialogue. Yeah. 
and I mean, to deepen dialogue and to have that, you talked about authenticity and integrity. Um, and in this world, sometimes there that's missing. And I think for many of us, it's because it's about well, for me, sometimes it's about trust. Um, can I can I show up as my authentic self? Um, am I safe here? Um, so how do we start to show up authentically in our lives? That's the first question. And then also in terms of integrity, how do we, what does that mean? And how do we kind of bring it through like a stick of, you know, as in a piece of rock, you know, how do we yeah. do that? Well, in, in my chapter, Slay Your Dragons with Compassion, um, then there's the, the there's, there's two golden rules for this. One is um, to speak your truth. And two is, and this is an interesting one, never hurt another person more than is necessary. Yeah. And what we often try to do, and my mother was a real master at this, is we tell white lies. She would call them white lies. And I never, I was never able to trust anything she told me because she would always tell white lies. It was always done with my good in mind, but it didn't allow me a place of knowing that this was a solid rock. So with our children, for example, if we can meet them with, with our true selves, and say the difficult things that need to be said, but practice doing that compassionately, that's a really good start to that practice. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it's, I mean, it's, as you say, it's telling the truth without, because, you know, so there's, a, there's a, a kind of a, um, a trend in America, and I can't remember what it's called. It's, maybe it's called radical truth telling, something like that. <laughs> and, um, we had an article that someone wrote for us and I, I thought, I can't, I don't want to put this in the magazine because it felt so harsh. It felt like I, I'm gonna tell the truth and destroy you kind of thing. And I, it, was, it didn't feel very kind to me and psychology is all about being kind. So that, that trick that you said there about uh, telling the truth and not hurting people. Um, more, than, more than is necessary. More so than is think. necessary. But how do you, how do you, that's, that's a very subtle distinction. It's a practice. I mean, with all these things, we're talking about a practice and a practice improves with time. So it might be that you, you go to a friend and you say, look, I've got something I need to say that's troubling me. If I'm clumsy at all, please let me know. But I really want to have an honest relationship with you. So I'd like to say it like it is with you. That's great. I think that that's, that's, um, that's a good preamble. Then you set a bar rather than you dive in. I mean, what you just described with radical truth telling sounds horrible. Yeah. Like, for me, it's like, if we leave another person feeling they've been given something rather than they've been attacked, then that's where the practice leads. I know with uh, my best friend, often that, that's the case where she'll, she'll say, I love you, you're brilliant, but you know, honey are you are you aware that this is what's going on i'm like and i can take it because i know that she's she's only got my best interest at heart she's got my back and i think there's that isn't there it's like when you when you've got when you've built a relationship that's built on trust and you know that somebody's got your back then it's almost you can hear you can hear that but even then it, it can hurt can't it absolutely and it, it, we will hurt each other if we're in deep intimate relationships we will hurt each other and actually if you look at relationships where people tread on cotton wool around each other what you see is a lack of depth that's there because they don't dare shake the boat at all and, and i'm you know there's another extreme to that where you're shaking the boat all the time you know i want to tell you how difficult you are also we can practice eye messages rather than you did this to me <clears throat> i felt this when this happened it's simple it's a practice yeah great I wonder, and again, all of these tools you're sharing in your in your book, <coughs> your dragon with compassion. But I think compassion is the key word here, isn't it? It's about you know uh, messaging in a compassionate way. Um, you talk a lot in the book about finding harmony, and I, I always talk about kind of finding your way back to center again. You know, so I, I'm constantly triggered. I've done all this self development for mm. years, and years. But I'm constantly triggered, but that's okay as long as I can find myself back to center. So in the book, which are the tools that would you recommend that are great about bringing yourself back again, you know, to, to that to place of not being triggered? There's a saying I use in groups, which I also have to tell myself when I also lose it, which is quite regularly as well. Yeah. Um, and that is your breath is your friend. And, and so for me, the first place, the first place when we want to start 
is slow it right down with the breath so that you're actually coming from a place where you've got more spaciousness and then you stop reacting to situations and you start responding rather than reacting. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, in this current situation, it feels like, it, you know, it's one long reaction. You know, there's all of the, you know, we're being bombarded by all of this information and then there's the American election going on and and it's all of this stuff. And it, I, I feel like I, I'm constantly having explosions of reactions within me. And it's just like, so as you say, bringing yourself back to the breath of like, I'm here right now. This is okay. Um, in the book, um, my favorite exercise um, was befriend death, <laughs> which doesn't sound very cheery. Tell me about that exercise and, and maybe take us through that because I think it's, for me, was a really, really profound and transformative practice. What is that about? I think it, we live in a death-phobic death society. So that actually we avoid death like the plague. We are all going to die. And that isn't a terrible tragedy. In fact, there's one thing I say in the book, I tell a Sufi teaching tale, which is um, a, a king asks his wise man, um, can you give me some a, a blessing, please? And the, and the wise man makes him a ring, which says, grandfather dies, father dies, son dies. And the king is outraged and says, how dare you give me that as a blessing? He said, it's a blessing when things happen in their natural order. And so for me, death, the death of my mother and my father was not a tragedy. It was, it was painful, um, but it was in the right order. They were both in their 90s. But Melissa dying at 33 was a tragedy. And I've had to find ways of coming to terms with that. But the exercise um, I look at with death is creating a scenario where we, we, look, we do dare to look death in the eye and we face our own death. And, um, and also it will help us to, to work with life. So I ran um, a death group for a number of years, which was people, all of, all of whom were people in their, above their, in their 60s and above. And, um, and we would talk about our experiences of death our fears around death. It was the most exquisite conversations that happened. It wasn't sad or depressing, but we would do exercises like this one where you look at, say you were going to die tomorrow or in a year's time, what would you wish to have completed or done? Um, and um, what goals do you want to achieve? Um, how would you like to be remembered? And what can you do to take that from wishful thinking to actuality? Now, for me, I, I realise that this book is my legacy. I want to be remembered because actually I've managed to put together the, the things that have educated me in my life for the past 70 years. Um, and have you told those close to you that you love them? That's such a simple thing. And I was so pleased that before my mum died, I was able to say to her, you know, mum, you know, I, I want you to know I really love you. And she, she really received it. And for me, that was a, her receiving it was a real blessing as well, that she wanted to hear that. Yeah. Um, and uh, what would you be sad if you were to, to, to die tomorrow? What would you be sad that you hadn't fulfilled or achieved? Yeah. Um, which relationships need healing and forgiving? Do it, clean up the dross that's in your life. If there's an old relationship where there's a, there's a lot of anger and hatred and, and resentment, deal with it and take responsibility for it. Don't blame the other person, um, but see if it's possible to clean it up. Um, and what support do we need in order to live out some of our goals? Um, and this is the bit I like in my, my exercise, which is draw a picture of your gravestone and write on it how you would like people to remember you. Um, yeah. And um, I, I've also talked about the possibility of volunteering at a, at a, at a hospice or something like that. But yeah. it's interesting, I love going around um, cemeteries. And I went around um, Highgate Cemetery recently and, yeah. and I was looking at gravestones and I saw the gravestone of, of Alexander Litvinenko, the, the Russian um, who was poisoned and killed. Um, and the, it was a beautiful piece from his wife. And it says something along the lines of, I can't remember exactly, it says something along the lines of that when a person dies for, for the, 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 their, their community, that's a tragedy. For the individual, that's the greatest tragedy you can imagine. And I just thought what love she had for him and that came through on his, on his inscription. Then I was walking past some old gravestones and one of them said, about someone, he did his best. And I thought, oh my God, wouldn't that be a horrible way to be remembered? I don't know. I think we're all doing our best. But, well, yeah. that is true. but, but um, I, one of the things I've, I've said at the end of that chapter is to go to this book, um, The Five Invitations by Frank Ostaszewski, um, where he's, he founded the Zen Hospice in San Francisco and sat with more than 2,000 people while they died and came up with these five invitations that would actually be the thing they wished they'd done. So he would have an invitation like, 
Um, actually, I can't remember the invitations now, but um, it, there, there, there is a profound book. It does have some lovely yeah. practices in there as well. Yeah. It's practical. I mean, your whole book is a kind of a love letter to the Melissa. To oh, the absolutely. Thank you. That's, that's really touching. It is. No, well, it is. And, and, but also, you know, you're walking the talk in terms of um, using a, this huge wake up call to not only transform your own life, but, you know, transform other people's lives. Um, and I, I really think this book is quite extraordinary. And I know it's getting incredible praise from, from, from Eckhart Tolle to Elizabeth Gilbert, who, one of psychology's favorites. So you've done a fantastic job. So I just want to say thank you for having the courage and having to get over this terrible tragedy and, and making something very, very precious out of it. So thank you, Malcolm. Thank you so much, Susie. And so, it's so good of you to have me on your show. I really appreciate it. It's lovely to see you. And um, thank you once again. Uh, put up the book again. Let's do another plug. Thank you so much. This is great. Slay your dragons that way with compassion. Um, this is a fantastic book. Do read it. And this is the wonderful Malcolm Stone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.